Alrighty, so I've never given this presentation before, so you know it's going to be interesting. So, but maybe before we start, so how many people, um, you know, work in government or work with government? Okay, quite a few. How many of those people also with open source in government? Okay, no one. <laughs> That's going to be great. Um, how many people did attend my keynote? All of you. Okay. How many people actually paid attention? Everyone. Okay. So I can skip this slide. <laughs> I kept it in. I wasn't sure if it was useful. Um, anyway, so as I said, I've never given this presentation before, um, and I'm not necessarily an expert in government, but I like to believe I've an, I'm an expert in open source. And in my work, I've actually worked quite a bit with the government. We've built quite a few government sites, um, and I've been in touch with quite a few people in government. Um, for example, we helped build whitehouse.gov. I've met with uh, Vivek Kundra, who is the, uh, or was the CIO of, of the United States. Uh, so I've had a chance to talk with you know, a lot of these people. Um, also Tim O'Reilly, um, who is you know, one of the driving forces behind Web 2.0, as well as uh, Open Government is an investor in Acquia. So I've had a chance to talk with quite a few people in this space. So I'm not the expert, but I think I have a perspective on it based on those conversations. So what I wanted to do in this presentation was basically present you some of the things that I've learned uh, and some of the things that I've seen and maybe talk a little bit about what I think is the history behind some of those things. So first, I wanted to talk a little bit more about open source. I've already talked about that uh, yesterday. Um, I wasn't sure if that was all clear to everyone, but this slide I put up yesterday as well. And it basically lays out the four freedoms that you get with open source. And so that means, again, that everybody can you know, download and install open source software. But on top of that, people can look at the source code and when they see bugs, they can fix the bugs. When they see uh, things which are missing, they can go and you know add to the program. And then uh, finally, they can also share those changes with others. So first and foremost, I, I guess, uh, open source is a license. And there's many open source licenses. Um, there's a GPL, there's you know, a whole bunch more. But again, as I explained yesterday, um, the fact that people share, or the fact that an open source license encourages people to share, actually leads um, to collaboration. Collaboration leads to innovation. And so because of that, open source is also kind of a development model. It's a way of working together with you know, hundreds or thousands uh, of people. So I figured I would dive a little bit more into uh, open source. And uh, you know, so where did open source start? This is a baby elephant, by the way. Um, but Richard Stallman, how many people know Richard Stallman? No one? So anyway, he's, he's kind of like the founding father of the free software movement. Um, and he started it because he was tired of Unix and he wanted to uh, you know, basically started GNU, which stands for GNU's not Unix. Um, and he came up with the first open source license um, out of MIT. Um, there's a couple of other people that are key in the open source uh, movement. Another one is um, Eric Raymond. Um, he's, um, he's well known because he coined the term open source in the early 90s. Uh, and he has been sort of the unofficial spokesman for open source uh, for many years. Um, He's probably very, f you know, he's very famous actually for a book or a paper really that he wrote, which is called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. How many people have read that? No one? You should definitely read it. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. It sort of explains the open source development model and compares that to the traditional development model. It's a free paper, but you can also buy it as a book uh, of Amazon if you would like. Um, and interestingly enough, um, he sort of, has a few different viewpoints compared to um, um, you know, other people. Um, but he's also the founder of the Open Source Initiative. Um, and the Open Source initi Initiative is kind of a standards body that looks at licenses and you know, declares them either open source or not. So uh, he did that for a while. He stepped down from that role. But these two people have been key to you know, open source, of course. Uh, today, open source is sort of a disruptive shift. Uh, it changes the way people adopt software. It changes the way people develop software. 
uh, and it's you know particularly disruptive to proprietary software. So that's a little bit about open source. I don't know if everybody, is there any questions about open source? I want to make sure you know, people understand what it is. No questions? OK. Um, so what's driving open source, and specifically, what's driving open source uh, in government? And I think for, for people in open source, we can probably guess the answers. But um, so I went out on the net, and I did some Googling, and I found a few. Uh, surveys, um, specifically about open source in government. Um, and as you can see on the slide, 80% of the people that responded to one of those surveys said that open source is, you know, they like open source but because it avoids uh, vendor lock-in. And that's very true because, uh, in a way, open source flips the model around. If you buy commercial or proprietary software, as a, as a buyer or as a user, you're taking a risk because you're selecting a vendor. And if the vendor goes out of business, you're toast. With open source, the risk is on the vendor, not on the buyer. And that's a very big difference. And the risk is on the, uh, on the vendor because you know, if I'm working with you as a vendor or a commercial organization providing support or you know, other services and I'm unhappy, I can take all the software and go to another a commercial organization that can provide me the exact same service, right? And because of that, there is there is no vendor lock-in uh, with open source. Uh, obviously, cost and price is always um, an interesting pull for open source, especially in an economic downturn. Um, so, there's another survey. Uh, it's a little bit older, but it's, it was done by Computer World, and for some reason, 80% uh, of the people used open source for cost saving purposes. Um, again, no dependency on a supplier, so the same thing uh, was there. 40% said it's actually better, which I talked about at length, I think, yesterday, about how the community of people just create so many modules and the reach that a system like Drupal has uh, you know, basically translates to the fact that it has been tested over and over again by you know, millions of websites out there. Um, so better functionality. Um, a big reason, and you know, basically because other people are adopting it in the organization, which has always been a big thing of what we needed to do in the past and still today. It's like educating people about what is open source and why it's okay to use and why there's no security issues and, and all of those things. Um, specifically in government, there's been um, a lot of research on open source, and um, like you know, the research. It's quite interesting because the estimates of potential cost savings are quite remarkable. Like in the U.S., um, you know, they believe that by adopting open source, the government could save 3.7 billion dollars, and in the U.K., that number, you know, comes out at about a billion dollars, which are, you know are big, big numbers. So, you know, what that led to is <coughs> essentially that more and more governments uh, all around the world are establishing policies right now that forces government agencies to look at open source. It doesn't necessarily mean they always have to use open source, but what was the case in the past is that open source wasn't considered as an option. And now there's a lot of policies, including in the US government, that basically uh, says that uh, agencies also need to evaluate open source alternatives to proprietary alternatives. And in some countries, though, there is an actual mandate that it has, that certain things have to be open source. Um, so, great evolution for open source. So, next I would like to give a few examples of how, you know, governments are using open source. And then I'll, and then in the section after that, I'll talk a little bit more about the history of you know, open source in government, open data, and open government um, in general. So some quick examples. Obviously, whitehouse.gov uses Drupal. I think it's a great example. Um, you know, why do they use Drupal? Um, I think there's a whole bunch of reasons. But uh, in talking to them, one of the, the key things that the Obama administration wants to do is to provide more transparency, transparency to the citizens, right? And it so happens to be that you know, Drupal as a tool is great at, you know, sort of communicating and sharing uh, data. And so technically, it's a great fit. But also, I think 
conceptually, a lot of the values of open source, collaboration, sharing, transparency, um, I think are shared with uh, the administration. Lower cost, obviously a big deal, and uh, more flexibility. Um, flexibility is key um, for them because, and I can't talk about the details, but they have really ambitious plans of what they want to do with whitehouse.gov. Um, you know, if you go to the site, you can you can already start to see some of those things. Like, they launched the feature "We the People," um, which basically allows everybody, every citizen, to log in onto the website. So all of a sudden, everybody gets a login, and they're able to participate in you know petitions and and all of those things. If you haven't checked that out, it's it's quite worthwhile. So it's an example of an initiative um, that they took. That's basically changing the way governments work, frankly, and it's changing the way uh, governments interact with citizens. And to do so, they need a platform that needs a lot of flexibility. And ever since you know White House switched to Drupal, almost every other department in the U.S. government switched over as well. So, uh, commerce.gov is a Drupal site. You know, ed.gov is a Drupal site, and there's dozens and dozens more. Uh, but not just in the U.S. government. Um, in Australia. Um, almost 70% of all the uh, government agencies use open source, uh, and that's for a total of more than 200 projects. Um, in India, interestingly, um, they have built um, a Linux distribution, you know, open source, right, uh, specifically for the Indian people with support for all of their languages and, and stuff like that. This slide I just added because of the, the name of the town. <laughs> which is unpronounceable. Um, but, you know, they use a bunch of open source. <laughs> um, and they use open source um, in their school systems and, you know, things like that to basically help bring more technology to their people. And in Asia in general, I think open source is, you know, is, is very well advanced there. They have like, um, like FOSS Asia, for example. It's a, you know, it's a government-funded organization that, that basically uh, tries to encourage open source in government there. Um, specifically for the use of Drupal in government, there's lo lots and lots of examples. I'll, I'll fly through some of them uh, here. So people in government, uh, this is the um, Jamaican prime minister. His website is, is built on Drupal, already mentioned White House, obviously. But, you know, the Australian prime minister sites is, is, is built on Drupal. Um, the governor of New York, that's a Drupal site. Uh, the deputy prime minister of the UK, that's a Drupal site. Um, the governor general of New Zealand, um, the governor of Tasmania, you know, it goes on and on and on. The Belgian prime minister, the king of Belgium, it's quite cool, and then the king of pop. Uh, Michael Jackson is a Drupal site, and it's actually, a, you know, quite the interesting one. Um, of course, when he died, caused a huge traffic spike. Um, it's one of Sony's, you know, artists, but, um, you know, they managed to scale the site. Um, so a lot of individuals, a lot of national governments um, as well, New South Wales, um, you know, Victoria, the um, New Zealand House of Representatives, they use Drupal. The Republic of Shaka, Shaka, not sure. Um, another, you know, government website in the U.S. And I'll come back to this one in a in a bit. Uh, the Open Data website in the U.K. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, the election website for the Virgin Islands, uh, the New York State Senate. This one is quite interesting. Like one of the things that they did, they basically gave all of their members a Twitter and a Facebook account and a blog. Uh, as well as, um, so ba you know, so basically direct communication with their citizens. Another cool thing that they did is whenever they're working on legislation, they put it up on the website and they're inviting all of the citizens to basically go in and comment directly on proposed legislation. So it's quite cool. So no longer does it go through, you know, like four levels of, you know, other people and nobody gets to see it really or it's not really accessible for people. Um, so they've changed that there, uh, all built on Drupal. Uh, the French government portal, another example. Lots and lots of local governments, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of examples. Uh, the city of Brisbane. Um, next slide. 
uh, Buddha Berg, um, the website of London, london.gov.uk is a Drupal site. Um, Miami Springs, you know, I can go on and on and on. Um, government funded programs, these are also quite cool. Um, the Human Rights Museum, the Australian Conservation and Zoo, Nova Scotia, um, the Russian Trade Federation, the education you know, website in, in Puerto Rico, lots of NASA sites, um, the website of you know, uh, Athens in Greece, and so forth. So you know, lots and lots of examples. So anyway, more interestingly though, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, open government. Um, and I think open government was inspired by open source, obviously. Uh, but at some point, basically, open source sort of crossed into government, and people wanted to try and apply a lot of the principles of open source uh, to government. Uh, and it sort of started off, um, you know, a number of years ago with this website, Apps for Democracy. Anyone knows about this or not? Uh, but, but basically, Vivek Kundra, who was the CIO of the United States, you know, back then was like the CIO of the state of Washington. Um, or DC, um, and he basically got tired of doing things the old way, and the old way was spending millions of dollars on contractors to build something, um, and then it would take, you know, a number of years of work, and often would result in a crappy product, and so he toyed with this idea of changing the model, and so what he did is he basically provided like a dozen of sources of data feeds, right? And then he organized a contest, and I think the total budget was uh, $50,000, right? So he provided these data feeds, and then he said, um, you know, he basically said, build something using these data feeds. Make sure that whatever you build is open source, that was a requirement, and then we'll split $50,000 of prize money um, for you know, to whoever built the best applications, um, and so I think within a few weeks, had a whole bunch of applications, and he estimated that um, by spending fifty thousand dollars of price money and making those feeds available, um, that in thirty days they got two point three million dollars worth of value, right? Um, and so I made this statement, which is apps for democracy produced more savings for the DC government than any other initiative. And that sort of was the start um, of the idea that governments should focus on publishing data streams rather than doing the analysis of the data. It's a very big shift in thinking and attitude. Um, and the idea here is that if the government does nothing but produce those data streams and they spend a lot of their time making sure that these data streams are proper so that you don't get into privacy issues, even if you combine like 12 data streams, that there's no, no ability to detect um, like personal information, if you will. Um, but governments produce those data streams and then you leave it up to the citizens, research institutions, universities, whatever, to basically mash up all the data, um, to visualize and analyze the data, um, and to bubble up issues. And then when issues are detected, yes, the government can help resolve them. And so a couple of these apps that came, came out of Apps for Democracy, and these are quick little apps, but um, one of them was iLife.at. It, it basically combines a whole bunch of data so you can see on a map uh, where all the banks are, the gas stations are. You can see things about you know uh, ethnicity, age, and you know all of these things. So quite handy. I mean, it's not like it you know, blows your mind out, if you will, but it's quite the interesting um, application. There's also other things you can do with this app, which is it basically visualizes crime data on a map. So you can see where, you know, areas might be unsafe or, you know, uh, things like that. So quite cool. Another interesting app was this one, which is basically um, combining uh, the poverty rate with um, the school system or the quality of the schools. And, you know, again, it won't be a surprise to see that there is, you know, a correlation between, you know, poverty and, and weaker 
um, you know, educational system. But it's quite cool to visualize it, and it's quite cool that you know people like you and I that we can start visualizing those things, and that we can start to surface some of those things and make it available um, to others, right? Um, and these are simple examples, but imagine what could be done if you have a little bit more time, a little bit more effort, um, what kind of things you could start to discover. So what happened, of course, was President Obama was elected, Vivek Kundra, who was then the uh, CIO of, the, of, of DC. He was actually promoted, if you will, to be the you know, global uh, CIO of, of the states. One of the fir first websites he built, uh, it's also a Drupal website, is, it's called recovery.gov. Uh, and basically Obama passed a 80, 80, $800 billion stimulus bill. I'm not sure if you remember. But the goal of this website was to track every single dollar which was being spent um, as part of this you know, bill. And so they built this website. It was a great success for Drupal. It was a, another great win, if you will, for the open data, open government movement, and another like sort of tipping point in that. Um, and then they built one of my favorite sites ever, which is the IT dashboard. How many people know this website? Uh, anyway, so it's another website which came after recovery.gov uh, and was, again, one of those tipping points towards the open data and open government model. But essentially, um, what this website does, it provides a dashboard for all of the agencies, all of the departments within the uh, US government, and it tracks every dollar spent. Um, and so at a high level, and you know, we're looking at the Department of Health and Human Services here. So there are three categories. Um, uh, the dollar amount, which is, is a project uh, or is the agency on track relative to their budget? And then there's a calendar, which means are they on track relative to the, the timing of the delivery of the project? And lastly, um, is the project being accepted by the stakeholders? So they boiled all of their work down into these three things. But then it gets even better. Um, so for each of the agencies, you can zoom in to the next level. And you start to see each of the individual projects. So they have a, a $4.6 million project, a $29.7 million project. And again, you can see you know, how it's tracking. You know, it's yellow, it's red, it's green, right? Which is quite cool, because all of a sudden, that data becomes uh, visible uh, for all of us to see. And then the next level down, and this is my favorite part. Um, they actually show the picture of the guy responsible for the project. Isn't that cool? So if a project is slipping, if somebody's wasting money, you can actually go in and see who's responsible for it. Um, and also, all of this data is made available um, through data feeds. So people could start to build mashups. People could start to combine the data, see how somebody and you know somebody in a leadership role, how his performance or her performance uh, has been over time. Is he constantly late in delivering project and, and stuff like that? So uh, quite cool. Um, and again, at the bottom you can see, you know, how the project is tracking. So it seems to be on you know on track relative to cost and schedule, but it's not really well accepted. So he's building something which you know may not be relevant. Uh, and this website actually led to, um, you know, sort of a much bigger movement, which was the data.gov movement, where all of a sudden, um, U.S. government created a portal site, if you will, where they aggregated, you know, thousands and thousands of, of data feeds. So they wanted to take it to the next level, um, which you can see here. Um, and, you know, you can see some of the data feeds here, but essentially people could search on whatever different formats, um, people would rate the quality of the quality of the feeds and so forth. Um, and this is like a massive change in attitude. It's not an easy change, right? And it takes an enormous leap of faith, I think, to make the switch as a government, to, to make the switch from analyzing all the data yourself to being just producers of data. Um, or it helps if there's a presidential memorandum as well. Uh, which is essentially what uh, President Obama did. Um, so President Obama, and this has been like two years ago, 
he launched the Open Government Initiative. And it's quite remarkable. Um, and it's one of the reasons Drupal was, uh, Drupal accelerated in open, you know, within the US government. But essentially, he said three things. In 120 days since he launched that thing, uh, each agency needs to publish what they called an open government plan. So they needed to come up with a plan on how they're gonna open up all of their data, right? Then within 45 days, each federal agency needed to publish at least three high quality data feeds. So they only had 45 days to make their first feeds available. And then 60 days was given um, for each uh, department to set up a slash open uh, website. So it's pretty cool. So if, if you go to any government website, like whitehouse.gov slash open, you get a list of all of their data feeds. If you go to et.gov slash open, uh, Department of Education, you get a list of all of their data feeds. So he established kind of like a, an, you know, a standard for where you can find these uh, data feeds. Of course, this uh, memorandum you know, triggered a lot of people to publish their data feeds and to adopt you know, some of the open source technologies because having to build, um, you know, having to build a website in 60 days is, you know, and make these data feeds available is a pretty big challenge for some of these organizations. Um, so, you know, originally inspired by open source, uh, a move to open government, and ultimately that led to open data. Uh, right now it's pretty well accepted. Um, there is, you know, data.gov, data.gov.uk, uh, yeah, and you name it. Basically every country, or maybe not every country, but, you know, many, many countries all around the world have adopted the same model. And it was inspired uh, by the U.S. government. So, you know, it's pretty cool that the, the U.S. government set the example for many other governments around the world. It's kind of a big thing right now. Um, there is conferences on open data. There is conferences on open government. Um, so it became quite a phenomena. Um, but again, the central idea is to make the data available, let other people experiment with you. And just like in open source, like I've seen with Drupal, I think you would be surprised about how many people actually want to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> like relative to Drupal, I didn't know, you know, thousands of people want to help build Drupal. And so I think it could be quite a surprise. Um, so, you know, to wrap it up, I think, um, Open source in government, it brings a lot of the open source values to the government, makes access to information you know, much more easier, uh, empowers people to get involved with their governments, and you know, essentially brings a lot of innovation uh, to the government. And it's you know, pretty exciting to be, to be watching that from the sidelines. So um, you know, with that, I'd like to say thank you and maybe um, discuss this some more and or, and or answer some questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I like the idea of all of these developers worldwide contributing to the project. How do you maintain quality in that in that environment? Right. When you have all these people who have these codes. Right. So I think well the government like when I talked about this with Vivekundra, I said, you know, the government's primary purpose is to maintain the quality of the data feeds. I mean, that's a very hard problem, of course, right? Um, so the quality of the data feeds needs to be correct. Um, the quality of the applications, if you make them open source, which he, he encourages to do, like he did with the Apps for Democracy thing, then everybody can go in and, and look at, you know, the, um, the algorithms used to analyze the data. So that means, you know, sorry? Right. Right. So in for open for open the answer is well for Drupal, yes, we have a central repository where all our modules live, but it's not restricted to Drupal, right? So um as a whole, people upload their stuff everywhere. And there is tons and tons of websites where 
you can find stuff that people develop that read data feeds. But the, the underlying point being is that if it's all open source and you don't trust the data or you don't trust the results, rather, you can go in and look at the code, see if there is a bug, and help fix it, um, which I think is a great thing. Um, but I have, uh, I think I have a few, a few slides with resources. Um, oops, but there is, um, there is this website, opensource.com slash government. Um, this one is pretty interesting, which is uh, actually launched by the White House, which is called Open Source for America. Uh, and they try to be like a portal from where you can find a lot of these things. Um, so that's, that one is, is, is worth checking out. Um, they have a bunch of st of case studies and success stories, and you know basically it's a, a good resource with a lot of starting points. Um, there's other things like um, the Open Source uh, Software Institute, um, OpenGovernmentData.org is another resource, uh, and I don't know all of them too well, but uh, OpenGovPartnership.org is another resource. So there is these portal sites, if you will, from where you can find. Um, a lot more information on where to find the stuff and uh, how to get involved. So, we had another question as well, or? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. So the question was, after the open government initiative, we saw an explosion of Drupal, right, for this purpose. So we did a couple of different things. First of all, we we launched a distribution um, of Drupal, which basically provided them a slash open website out of the box. So as a community, we sort of rallied together. It was driven by a company called Phase 2 Technologies primarily, but we sort of came together and said, we're going to make this very easy for these agencies to fulfill this, you know, this thing. Um, and so a lot of these agencies use that, but they, they didn't have to, of course. Um, a lot of people use Drupal when they need to build a website quickly uh, because the time to deployment is so much sh shorter. Uh, and so I think in terms of features and functionality, we have a lot of features around you know, commenting and blogging and like a lot of features which are social features. You know, Drupal was a good match. Um, and then the fact that the time the deployment was so low and that there was an out of the box solution which we quickly put together, you know, in a couple of weeks, it sort of helped when, you know, all of these little pieces, if you will, I think contributed to that adoption. So, more questions? Sorry, compared to what? The use. Sorry? Compared to what? Oh, I said, so the, I thought your question was so, how does Drupal provide transparency or open source software tr provides transparency to White House at Gov? Is it because everyone can see it or? Yeah, so they use. Um, so what 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 the what the Obama administration wants to do is they want to engage more with the citizens. They want to, you know, like, you know, they want people to come to the site and to participate, to have discussions, um, to be able to vote on petitions and all of those things. So they needed a system that allowed them to build um, that kind of website. Um, and I think it's very much part of Drupal's DNA. Like um, yesterday, my keynote, I think I showed a screenshot of the initial release announcement of Drupal 1.0, and it came with forums and blogs and RSS feeds and, and you know, some of the other features that they, that they want to use to provide that transparency to uh, citizens. So conveniently, they didn't have to build that from scratch. So cool question. Sorry. Well, you first and then Ed.
Right. Some of the so the question was: Is there any examples of you know negative things related to use of open source in government? Right. Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, one of the challenges, of course, often with open source is they say there is no support. Like if you have this thing, it's being built by hundreds of people. How do you get support? Um, frankly, that's why I started Acquia. Um, so that's one thing which we could. Um, take off, and so it's not an issue for Drupal, but you know it may be an issue for other open source projects because there might not be a support organization behind, um, you know, behind another open source project. It's not the case for every open source project. Uh, security is sometimes a concern, um, but I think in terms of of Drupal, we actually take security very serious. We have a dedicated security team with like 40 people on it, um, you know, they obviously do security audits and, and all of those things. So I think, you know, I think the security question is always a little bit uh, interesting um, because we, uh, in many ways, we have better security standards than proprietary software. Um, and, you know, anyway, it, it's an interesting question. So security is often a concern, but I think we've, we're quite good at you know, responding to that. Uh, the other major concern often is scalability. Like, you know, is Drupal or is a PHP application capable of scaling to hundreds of millions of page views a month? Um, because a lot of these organizations, they work with, you know, Java enterprise architects and all of those, you know, kinds of people. I have a background in Java. <laughs> uh, but the answer is yes, it does scale. Um, but that's often a very common question. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I was actually just going to point out there's a website called opencongress.org. Um, and if you guys want to see where this is in action, if you can look at the representatives. So, for example, I just looked up uh, John Boner, and right away you see he voted with his party 100%. Um, the top donations were 164,000 from an unknown category. Right, that's cool. Right, great, great example. Another question? Um, I don't know, actually. So the question is, who's track of using the data, the op defeats, and who's looking at all the results? Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know, if they do track that stuff. I, I, I imagine they do some tracking, like every other website. <laughs> um, yeah, can't really answer the question. Cool. Any more questions? Question in the back, Katie. Um, so there's a question, again, I have bad hearing, so I'd, I wasn't able to pick up everything, but it's a question, um, is there a correlation between adoption of open source in government and education and technology companies? Um, hmm. I, I'm sure there, there is. I'm not sure it's a direct connection. Um, I'm sure some universities teach open government now. Um, or some of the principles. Um, some universities definitely started to teach Drupal, but whether it's directly correlated with open government, I don't know. I think it's more as a phenomena, you know, as a as a bigger movement, probably that it's being being looked at. 
So I don't know. Don't have a good answer. Sorry. It's a good question. Um, well, there's data.gov. I don't, I'm not sure it's like overlaying demographic. Right. I'm just curious if there's a private sector. I see. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Do you know of any? Or? I know the Sunlight Foundation is the one that drives most of it. Like the Right. Yeah, again, I'm I'm not claiming to be the expert in this field. I, I was just talking about all of the things that I've seen and tried to, you know, put it together. Um, but it's a good question. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for your time. <laughs>